settle down, settle down, return to your seats. I am aware that my arrival is a tad late, but that does not mean that my classroom should descend into barbarism in my absence. I apologize for being a bit tardy, but there was a small matter within the sub-level of Site Lambda that necessitated the immediate attention of a dimensional conjuration specialist, and as luck would have it, I was walking by and was the closest one available at the time. I won't go into too much detail about what transpired there, but suffice to say I believe that mistakes provide a unique opportunity to learn a lesson that can be reflected on going forward. So, if any of you get it in your head to attempt to open a dimensional tear into the elemental plane of fire, do make certain that the laboratory is using the correctly rated suppression wards for such a feat. Mm. I was not in the mood for a roasted coffee this morning, but it seems as if that decision was taken out of my hands. Oh well. At least there is still something left to enjoy. I believe those researchers would find being cremated alive a mercy compared to what I would do if their carelessness had cost me my morning drink. But alas, enough of me complaining about my co-workers. We do have a curriculum to attend to after all. In case some of you have forgotten, I am Professor Adair Shahar of the Anthem Institute, and I welcome you all back to the second introductory lecture on the lore and origins of the world of Tosvar. Currently, we are covering a brief overview of the world at large before delving into some of the more nuanced topics that exist within the world. In our last lecture, we touched upon the continent of Aelis, and the nations that exist and thrive upon it. And in this lecture, we will be doing much the same for another continent in the world of Tosvar. Today we are shifting our attention to the faraway continent of Volg, and the myriad of cultures and nations that exist there. Similar to Aelis, there are three countries that rest themselves upon the landmass. These are the Bronze Tops, Canis, and the shifting wilds. With that, let us begin. Open your textbooks and do try to take notes in case of a pop quiz. Going by alphabetical order for no particular reason, after all, why not? We shall be looking at the mountain system that dominates the northern region of Volg and even extends into some areas of the Vitalite Ocean. This area has come to be known as the Bronze Tops. The name of this region is derived from a naturally occurring metallic alloy, reminiscent of bronze, that caps the summits of some mountains in the area, and appears to be unique to this part of the world. Besides the expansive mountain ranges this region is famous for, there are also a great many valleys that give way to fjords and lowlands, as well as tundras and vast glacial expanses in the higher elevations. The climate of this region tends to range from cold to moderate, depending on the area, and it also tends to rain somewhat often within the bronze tops. Some of this is attributed to natural weather patterns, but there also exists an anomalous occurrence that appears from time to time, referred to as a maelstrom by the locals. This occurrence typically manifests as a heavy rainstorm with a much higher rate of lightning strikes than a typical storm. However, blizzards and hurricane-like manifestations have also been observed. Curiously, a maelstrom seems to have semi-predatory behaviors tending to manifest near settlements and actively moving towards them. For this reason, alongside many others, the Bronze Tops is indeed a dangerous and comparatively unsettled place. 
but one steeped in deep tradition and community. Individual freedom and self-sufficiency are pillars of the culture that is embraced by the many races who reside here, though a sense of community is also very relevant, as many find it difficult to survive without others. This focus on community has allowed groups of families over time to join together into a group that is known as a banner, so that they might better face the challenges of the land. Banners are semi-nomadic by nature, claiming areas as their own and moving from site to site within those borders, but large and established banners have founded permanent settlements that are scattered all over the region and enforce their own laws and practices within them. Trade is quite profitable, as the bronze tops is rich in metals and exotic woods, so these settlements are often moderately wealthy, and as such tend to have their own internal town guards, as well as public utilities such as libraries and bathhouses. However, due to the larger scale issues such as war or international debates, the leaders of the largest banners gather and form a temporary government called a moot. The moot's main purpose is to handle matters of tactics, diplomacy, and, occasionally, surrender. While important to the continued survival and preservation of both the people of the Bronze Tops as well as its many traditions, the moot is far from the highest authority in the land. That title belongs to the collective of dragons that have taken a portion of the Bronze Tops for themselves. The Enclave of Embers acts as the only established dragon settlement on Tospar, though calling them a settlement is not quite accurate, as they only seem to be interested in carrying out the duties they are charged with as world bearers, shaping the land to fit the mysterious wishes of the Wellspring and to fulfill the purpose the Draconic race has within the hierarchy of divinity. The Enclave mainly exists to handle matters of diplomacy with the other factions of the Bronze Tops, though the many banners that exist occasionally find themselves at odds with the Enclave, and outright conflict is not unheard of. In fact, if you are the type to put stock in the rumor mill, there are whispers of a banner that once specialized in hunting dragons, and that is beginning to return to the old ways. Moving down our list, we turn to the south, leaving the mountains and the, and the implications of a conflict behind to a nation where conflict has already come and gone, though the scars still linger to this very day. The country of Canis claims a majority of the land within Volg, and thus is one of the largest countries that currently exist on Tosvar. With such expansive territory, Canis has a wide variety of geographic features that, that range nearly every climate and terrain. The main body of Canis is composed of grasslands, forest, and cave systems that altogether form an affable climate with warm summers and freezing cold winters. While the territories that Canis has absorbed range from the tropical and arid prison coastline to the boreal forests of the Ashen Tiger. Some of you might be wondering how Canis managed to acquire such vast territory, and in many cases the answer is a mutually beneficial treaty signed so that these smaller territories become the vassal states of the much larger nation and benefit from its protection and economy. Though in the last century, Canis has experimented in a different approach to gaining more land, namely, conquest. The Ashen Tiger, for example, was once part of the neighboring country of the Shifting Wilds, and nearly 80 years ago, a land dispute within a local barony eventually boiled over into a conflict known as the Red Glade War, and Canis eventually defeated the forces of the Wilds and seized a large portion of the land for itself. And despite this action, Canis has an altogether favorable relationship with most other countries, 
though understandably, strained within the shifting wilds. Canis's governmental structure is that of a monarchy, with a crowned king and queen that command the nation as a whole, while having a myriad of smaller noble houses that run the day-to-day -day operations, and act as barons for the large tracts of land that the country possesses. Though currently, Canis is ruled by only a widowed queen, as the king tragically passed away many years ago, and the queen has not seen fit to remarry, appearing to simply hold the position until the prince comes of age to take his coronation and rule as king. Economically, Canis is quite wealthy, and boasts an impressive amount of exports that reach all over Tosvar, textiles, wood, Gemstones and other crafts and commodities are but a fragment of what is made and sold within its borders and beyond. This thriving economy allows Canis to invest heavily in itself, and the best example of this is the higher learning institution known as the Shirelin Academy, where all that exist under the monarchy can enroll and hone their skills, provided of course they can pay the tuition. Despite being an overall wealthy state, Canis is unfortunately difficult to police on a wide scale, due primarily to its size. And beyond the relative safety of cities and towns, a traveller might find themselves held up by opportunistic bandit clans, seeking to rob them of their valuables, or, in some cases, their very lives. Last but certainly not least is the mysterious and ever-changing lands of the Shifting Wilds. This area of Volg is quite difficult to accurately explain, as it appears to be in a near-constant state of change, through some manner of unknown anomalous force. The more mundane examples of such changes include the spontaneous combustion of plant life, that can result in wildfires or rivers reversing their flow overnight, while more extreme changes can include the sun not setting and simply reversing itself once it reaches its peak, or the creation of new and often contradictory climates and biomes, such as an arctic rainforest. These changes are referred to as fluxes by the native population, and allow the shifting wilds to have a wide variety of climates, some that are completely alien to the outside world, and can only exist within the magically infused lands of the wild. As you can imagine, life is difficult within the ever-changing wilds, and those that have called this place home have likewise been changed over time. The three main races that have found prosperity within these lands are the elves, Lycan, and Fay, and each of these races have individually managed to survive within the wilds, to build flourishing societies that have spanned thousands of years in some cases. But change is not limited to their own borders, and as such, as the foreign nations evolved and became more established, the races of the shifting wilds saw the need, saw the need to establish themselves as well. And so, the three dominant races struck a deal with each other to support and defend the wilds and all that called it home. And thus, the Skahan courts were founded, a triumvirate governing body that brought a sense of order to the wilds, although most outside of the country would still refer to it as a chaotic mess. Nevertheless, the courts were quite successful in unifying the wilds, and has proven to be an effective force in allowing the many races that live there the opportunity to prosper. Exports of the shifting wilds remain in very high demand due to the unique and often miraculous properties that the goods and materials produced there possess, allowing the wilds to hold some level of influence to barter and trade for anything they might desire. Indeed, Many nations have made concessions to the wilds that would have been considered ludicrous should any other nation have made them. The shifting wilds have unfortunately not done well internally in the past two centuries, however. 
as the Red Glade War with Canis resulted in widespread damage that has not fully healed even 80 years later. Not to mention the issues brought about by the careless creation of the Wendigo race through the union of Fey and Daemon bloodlines, that has been steadily increasing at an alarming rate, and in time, might emerge as the fourth dominant race within the wild. But change is the nature of these lands, and part of its charm is never quite knowing what the new day might bring. That seems like a good place to leave off for today. I believe that will cover everything for today's lecture. I do hope you learned something and, more importantly, took notes, as there will be a quiz in the future. I expect all of you to perform well in this, and for those of you that do not, you will be subjected to remedial one-on-one -on -one lessons with me outside of school hours. Be sure to gather your belongings before you depart, and remember to always strive to surpass your limitations. Amaranthine Ambition Well, go on, get out, I have work to do.